Yes, so uh, I have, uh, my name is Tim, and I have the uh, honor of taking the first slot after lunch. So my first um, task is to wake you all up, and I figured I'd do this by choosing weird colors for the slides. I hope it works. Are you awake? Yeah, okay, that's good enough. <laughs> okay, so um, Kafka. Who uh, attended the Kafka talk by LinkedIn last year at Berlin Buzzwords? Uh, a few. So I attended it as well, and it was the first time I heard about Kafka. And this was, in, in, in retrospect, it was the most interesting thing I, I, uh, I heard about it at, at Buzzwords. And I went back to my colleagues and, and told them, hey, they just presented the perfect system for us. This is what we have to, to use. Um, so um, I work at Wuga. We do social games. That is, who has ever played a Facebook game? Uh, not really target audience, maybe. So our, um, <laughs> our biggest competitor is Zynga. You probably know Zynga, Farmville, Frontierville, all this stuff. They are about as 10 times as big as we are, but we are trying to catch up. Um, and we are based in Berlin. Um, yeah, and so um, I found Kafka so interesting because um, up until last year, we did all the, um, the reporting uh, that's it was all on, on a very primitive system um, based around batch jobs. So we had nightly batch jobs. They would push the data into MySQL and then uh, run the reports. Uh, this works kind of okay, but uh, it means you always have to wait 24 hours until you get uh, an update, right? Um, okay, so Kafka. What is this Kafka thing? Uh, if you try to Google it, uh, you find a lot of other stuff like metamorphosis, um, the trial. That is not the Kafka we are interested in, right? That is the, the real Kafka. <laughs> uh, actually, I cheated a little bit. So actually, if you enter Kafka download, as I did yesterday evening, the first thing that comes up is Apache Kafka. Now, it, it wasn't like this half a year ago, because this is why I wanted to put in the slide. Now it's much easier to Google, so you will actually find it. Um, so. Um, it is uh, an open source project currently incubating at Apache, and it was contributed by, by LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, they built it for their own, like, they, for in-house use, and they have it in production since at least two years, I think. Um, so what is it? It is a high-throughput, persistent, publish, subscribe messaging system. Quite a mouthful. So let's, let's just go through um, from the back. Um, a messaging system. It's easy, and it's really it's just it, it's an, a messaging system in the classical sense. So it has a broker, not like zero MQ. It really has, has a broker. Uh, then you have any number of producers pushing stuff to the broker, and any number of consumers um, pulling data from the broker. So that's simple. Uh, it's publish subscribe. Okay, that's also easy. So this basically just means there is. Uh, on the broker, there is a number of topics. It's, it's flat, there's no hierarchy, just a number of topics. And each message belongs to exactly one topic. And each topic can have multiple or none or just one subscriber, right? Kafka doesn't care. It is persistent. So that's interesting because most messaging um, products are not primarily persistent. Maybe they have added it as an afterthought. But for example, uh, RabbitMQ uh, tries to do everything in memory because it's, it's faster. Um, but Kafka was designed with a different perspective. So they, they, it is really designed to be persistent. And I will explain uh, how this plays out. Um, so this means all the messages that go into Kafka stay in Kafka for a certain time, and then they are deleted. So it is not sort of like Kafka is not something where you want to store your data long term. It's just an intermediate store. So you can configure this, this, um, this interval. I think the default value is something like 24 hours or something. We use 30 days, which is rather large. Um, this just more or less, it just depends on how many messages you have and how much storage you have and how much you want to, to spend, right, of the storage for Kafka. But, uh, it is not meant to be a persistent, like, durable storage for years and years. 
Uh, and although it's persistent, it's also high throughput. So this sounds a little bit like a contradiction because all the others, they do it in memory to, to, be, to get high throughput. So I will explain a little bit um, the architecture, so how, how the internals of Kafka work. So basically, um, the, the, the topic is the, the base abstraction, right? So you publish a message to a topic. And the topic is, at least conceptually, it's just a single binary file on the broker. And if I publish a message, it goes into this file. It's appended to this file. And so each message also has um, an offset. This is just the, the byte position in the file where this message starts. Very simple. So the first message will have the offset zero. And then if I push some more messages, they will get uh, always increasing offsets, but not increasing. There's like, it's not a, a sequence like 0, 10, 20. It depends on the message size, right? So if the next message is one kilobyte, then the index will also increment by a thousand. Um, and yeah, and so the, the offset is very important because this is sort of like the primary ID of each message is the offset. So a message is, um, yeah, is identified in the stream by its offset. Um, and then there is one more thing, uh, because I think con conceptually it's, 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 a, it's one large binary file, but as it might in, in, in reality get too large, Kafka will behind the scenes chop it up into multiple segments. So you can say, okay, I want the segments to be one gigabyte, and once the size has been reached, Kafka will just transparently start a new one. So in, in reality, on the broker you have per topic, you have a directory, and in this directory, you have a number of segment files. And this is also the way Kafka gets rid of messages, because it just uh, looks at the timestamps of the, um, last, the last access timestamp of the segment file and checks if it has timed out. So this is it's very efficient to delete, right? You can just get rid of a whole gigabyte of messages in one go with one f-sync. Um, and now high throughput is the high throughput is, is basically is, is possible because it's always append only, right? So the, the, have the, the open segment files for the topics and messages just get appended at the end. And also not each message individually, but in batches. So it's, this is what makes it pretty fast. And so we have not benchmarked it ourselves, but um, LinkedIn says that a single Kafka broker can easily handle, let's say, 100,000 or 200,000 messages per second. That's quite a lot. Um, So uh, let's, let's have a look at what we at Vuga uh, use Kafka for and how, how we use it. Um, so this is um, a typical report. So we have for each game, uh, we have a, a daily report. And this is the thing I talked about that's generated by SQL, complicated SQL queries from a MySQL database. Um, and the data this report is based on is what we call tracking events from the games. So basically, this means uh, if you play one of our games, uh, if you log in, this is the first tracking event. This user has logged in. Then if you do something in the game, if you reach a new level, another tracking event. If you buy something, if you do, do some other significant action in the game, always generating tracking events, right? Um, yeah, so the basic architecture of, of a game is it has two parts. It has the, the client part is normally Flash or uh, an iPhone app. So this is where the actual game is running. And then we have a, a server part, a backend part, we just keep track of what's happening in the game and make it persistent. And uh, tracking is completely, diff is completely separate from that. So tracking is sort of like a centralized function we have um, one of the few functions we have centralized at Vuga is this, this tracking infrastructure across all games. Because it makes sense, right? It's sort of like always the same thing, just collecting events and aggregating them. <laughs> so um, the tracking system is, is at heart. It's still the same system as it used to be before, right? So uh, even when it was doing this batch processing, it was exactly the same system. It was just three Nginx servers. They are uh, load balanced by um, DNS round robin. And um, they just return a, 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 a transparent pixel. So they return a tracking pixel. And what they do is write the, the get params into the access log. 
and the get params is where all the interesting information about the event is stored in. So we used to just take the access logs and, and batch process them. And now the new thing is that we insert uh, each single event, each single request as it comes in, into Kafka. So the best way we found to do that is to use, um, uh, there's a Perl client for Kafka, and there's an Nginx Perl module. So it sounds a bit weird, but yeah, we are using, <laughs> we are, there's Nginx, and then through Perl it goes into Kafka. I'm sure there are other ways to do it. Uh, we also thought about maybe writing a native Kafka Nginx module. I'm pretty sure it's doable because it, the client is very simple, but we didn't have any need for that. It, it works really well. So um, that's just, um, so the three colors are the three tracking servers, and so at peak, but this is, I think this, this screenshot I took a few months ago, we were doing something like 7,000 messages uh, per second on the tracking system. So this is from all the games together. Yeah, and then, of course, we, because we use just a single Kafka server, we are a little bit afraid that it might <laughs> sort of like break down or something and, and leave us without any data. So uh, we have, actually, we have a second Kafka server that's just... Um, of like a warm standby, it doesn't get any data. I think Kafka is not even running there, it's, it's installed and we make sure that it can start up. And what we do is just by cron job every five minutes we rsync the segment files over. Uh, it's really, <laughs> this is really pretty, pretty primitive, but this is our high availability solution, right? So <laughs> if, um, if, if the first one should fail, it has not happened so far in the last half year, but if it should fail, then we would just fire up the second one. We would, yeah, we would lose a little bit of data, yeah, because the, the, maybe the cron job ran four minutes ago, so the segment files are not completely up to date, but so what? I mean, and yeah, we lose a few minutes, right? But we are up and running again after five minutes. Um, uh, yeah, and by the way, I would like to, so all the Kafka, I really, really like Kafka, <laughs> um, but we are using Kafka in the simple most way. And there, you can also use it in a more complicated way. So you can also, I skipped over the, the website where it says it's also a distributed messaging system. So you can have multiple brokers, you can have, then you need a zookeeper um, cluster to keep the state of the, so that the brokers can synchronize and the clients can synchronize. I'm not sure. I mean, it may be the case that LinkedIn actually needs that because they are much larger than we are. But I mean, we, we push quite a bit of traffic and we, it, we're just doing fine with one single box. And actually, this, the, the box can handle a lot more. I think that the, 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 maybe the 200,000 messages number is, is perhaps accurate. So this is what my, it's my gut feeling. So we have at least 10, 20 times to grow, right? So I would, if you, if, you, if you start using Kafka, maybe start as simple as possible <laughs> and only, because then if you have Zookeeper, of course, then one box is not enough, then you need at least three or five Zookeeper boxes and there's a lot of other stuff you have to configure. And I'm, I'm not actually sure that it's needed and it will, I don't think it adds so much value. You, we might also, like if, if one day we hit, we actually hit the, 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 the throughput limit of Kafka, we might also do sharding, right? We might push one game or the, uh, the first three games across one Kafka and the others across another one. And still, we wouldn't need Zookeeper. Okay, so now we have all the events in Kafka. And sort of like my mental image is this pipe, right? This, uh, or event bus, if you want a more fancy word. Data comes in on the left side and it, after 30 days, it falls out on the right side and it's gone. Um, and the nice thing is now, uh, now that we have this event bus, we can hook up any number of consumers to this event bus. They are completely independent. And this is the real value that Kafka gives us. So the first thing, of course, we build is the um, replacement for the, for the cron job. So we have um, a very simple consumer that just takes the event and, and inserts directly into my SQL. So the same reports can still run. The only difference is that whereas before we maybe uh, it took eight hours until all the data was in the database, so uh, the first report could only be generated in the morning and the last ones in the, in the afternoon. Now we can start at, I don't know, quarter past 12 and uh, the reports are finished much sooner. 
It's still the same report, right? Um, then we have another one that just pushes, that sort of archives all the events in S3. We don't use Hadoop so far, but we might, right, in the future, so we just keep track of everything. Then there is, oh yeah, this is another nice one. So then, of course, the idea is now that we have this capability to, to hook up anything to the live event stream, that we would also like to, to extract data in real time from the event stream. And just as a proof of concept, we built um, a very simple one that um, pushes some metrics to uh, Lib Librato. So this is like a, so, a sort of like a hosted metrics platform. We can just push data and they generate nice graphs like um, this one, for example. This is installs per minute by game. And this is really interesting because it's something we never had, right? <laughs> for two years, we were like driving blind. We, had, we, we, knew, we knew installs per day. But we never knew how the installs were um, distributed over the day. And it's kind of interesting. I mean, there are some spikes. Uh, that probably they, they are correlated to, to events that we know about. I mean, we have marketing campaigns that start at a certain time. Um, you can also pretty clearly see if there's a problem with a game. You can also see it in this graph, <laughs> although it's not an operations graph. But it, it, it pretty sh clearly shows if there's something wrong. Um, yeah, and so and 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 many many more. So this is just uh, I'm really just the beginning. So when I say event stream processing, I mean maybe the title is a bit maybe you're disappointed now because the actual event stream processing that could be done we have not even started to do. We could hook up Storm to it and do really fancy stuff, or we could uh, maybe what what Ted explained yesterday this um, uh, real time learning thing looks very interesting. Um, but really the important thing for us is that um, now we have this, this event bus in place, and whatever we come up with, whatever idea we come up with, we can very easily and very quickly um, try out. Because, so the, 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 really the, 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 the core feature for me is that all the consumers are completely independent. And they really are, um, I skipped over this part, so it is the job of the consumer to keep track of which part of the event stream he has already consumed. So the consumer has, uh, if it fetches more data, the consumer has to tell Kafka, OK, I have already seen the messages up to this offset. Now give me more. So this means also very easily you can, let's say, you come back to the office on Monday as you see the reports from the weekend are all wrong because there was a bug uh, that you introduced on Friday. You can just go back and reprocess the last two days, because you can just give it another starting offset, right? Um, although, the first, you have to find out the valid offset. That's, that tends to be a little problem, because, as I said, not every, num not every integer number is a valid offset. <laughs> you have to know where a message starts. And one of the easiest ways to find valid offsets is actually if you log into the, to the broker itself and look at the segment files. The segment files have as file name the starting offset. And they have a timestamp, right? A created timestamp. Or large last. So it's, it's sort of like a little index where you can look at various points in time where you might want to go back. You can also, of course, we could also build, I, I guess we could also build a consumer that keeps track of uh, each full hour or something or whatever. <laughs> Haven't needed it so far. OK. Um, yeah, and so we started building all these consumers. And then we started building them in Ruby because we are sort of mostly Ruby shop, um, uh, JRuby actually. And then we started, of course, we started to notice it's always the same pattern, right? So the consumer follows a certain structure. And so we extracted this into, into a lib called Kafka Ask. Um, and contrary to what I, to what I, um, to what I told in the, in, in the in talk description, it is not yet open source. We haven't gotten around to it. So if there's not, we are, we're not against open sourcing it. It's just that there's some stuff in there that really doesn't make sense for, for non-Wuga users because it has sort of like the event, our event structure in there. We, so I, I promise that we will open source it soon. Um, and this is the way it works. I mean, you can also build it yourself. It, it's really, it's not very complicated. So the basic structure is, um, so there's one limitation. A Kafka client can only connect to one topic. In our case, one topic equals one game. 
So, but you might also have a consumer, let, let's say the S3 consumer wants, of course, wants to, to, to archive all the data from all the games, right? So um, we need multiple instances of a Kafka client running to get all the data. And this is why, so although Kafka is sort of like a big queue, we have inside the consumer, we have a small in-memory queue again. And then we have multiple, what we call fetchers, Kafka clients pulling data out of Kafka and putting them in the queue. And then we have a pool of workers that do stuff with, uh, with the individual events. So, so far, I mean, this, this thing um, assumes that the, in, the events are completely independent or else the, 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 the worker would have to keep the state. But there's no guarantee that uh, events of the same kind go to the same worker or anything. So in our case, we don't make any assumptions about uh, dependencies between the events. Um, yeah, now, all that you see here is just, um, this is abstracted out. So actually, to, to build a new consumer, it's very simple, you just have to build um, basically a, a single Ruby function that is the the handler function that the worker will execute. And so this is the way it looks like uh, when you use it. So we say, okay, we want to start uh, such a Kafka as consumer. Um, and okay, we, tell, we tell it uh, which Kafka instance to connect to and what handler to invoke for the workers. And the handler has a very simple contract. Basically, it just has this handle, um, handle function, handle method that uh, gets an event and then so like the event um, has accessors for the various, this is the part we have to abstract out because this is <laughs> completely based on our, what, what our events look like. So our events have an, an IP address and they have um, uh, a timestamp. Okay, that's not, not super uncommon, but still. <laughs> uh, so for example, in this case, this is the, the, the stats handler. This is the thing that generates this librato. Uh, librato graph I showed before. Um, actually, it does it sort of like indirectly. Uh, what the stats handler does in this case is just take the data and uh, sort of like we pre-aggregate uh, this in Redis. I'm not sure if you can read it, but um, sort of like we, 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 um, we built a Redis key that is based on the timestamp, but uh, just on the minute resolution. So effectively, we we collect everything that happens in a single minute in, in, this, in, in various counters. And then there's a, a second one, which uh, I haven't here, a, a second, sort of like a second cron job running every minute that just updates a, new, a few new um, data points to, to Librato. Because we don't want to push a few thousand <laughs> per second, we just want to, to, to pre-aggregate, right? But it's, this is actually everything you have to do, and it's, it's super simple. We did an internal workshop with um, other development teams inside Vuga, and yeah, we, it's, it's basically we can get uh, people to, to build their own consumer in an hour or something. It's pretty nice because, I mean, just especially compared to the old situation where we knew we had the data somewhere, but it was either in log files on a server and nobody had access, of course, or it was in, this, uh, in the holy tracking database that also nobody had access to. So it was really, really, like, if you wanted to build something custom, it was really difficult to make progress, and so nobody even tried. Whereas now it's super easy. Every, uh, uh, anybody can go ahead, I mean, anybody inside Booga <laughs> can go ahead and uh, just um, sort of like come up with their own ways to, to, to work with the data, and that's very powerful. Yeah, so... Um, as I said, the, the, so Wuga has a, a GitHub repository where we push our, all our open source stuff. There is, um, we made some improvements to the Kafka Ruby client because it was broken in various places. Um, we also built an Erlang client because sort of Erlang is sort of like starting to be the second dominant language at Wuga. Uh, I believe we also have the Erlang one running in production, so in production, so it's 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 doing something with the event stream. Uh, and then Kafka asks this the JRuby lib that's not yet, so this repository is actually still private, but I, I will make it uh, public as soon as possible. Okay. So I hope you have a few good questions because there's still a lot of time left. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, uh, let's let's start here. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you uh, use the rsync solution to uh, have a duplicate uh, of the Kafka instance. Yes. Uh, you also mentioned that for uh, that Kafka has something based on Zookeeper, but is is there something built into Kafka to make it more uh, failure re resistant? Uh, yes. So if we are still on the 0 0.6 release, which was sort of like the, f the first release, I think they they published at Apache, I think. Uh, but it's, it's, it's basically it's a year old, and now there's a 0 0.77 release. That's the, the current one, and it has new features, which I have not looked at uh, very closely, but I believe it also has some failover thing in there um, and some new replication between brokers. But as I said, uh, we, we, are, we, 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 de we decided from the beginning not, not to, to, to exclude everything that, that's based on Zookeeper because we just want to keep it as simple as possible. So we have not looked at these things. Uh, and I cannot tell if they work or not. But this R thing <laughs> works pretty well <laughs> so far. Yes, I was wondering if there's any limitation on uh, some what you can put in a Kafka queue. Is there a size limit or a certain structure? Yeah, no, there's no so there, there's no structure. It's just for, for Kafka, everything, a message is just a binary blob. So it will not change the message in any way. It will just, it's just, it's opaque. But it is sort of like in, in, the, in the Kafka documentation, it is sort of assumed that the messages are not too big. So maybe a reasonable size would be a couple hundred bytes, maybe a kilobyte, maybe, I don't know, maybe you could try with a megabyte, but not much more, I think. Uh, oh, there's a microphone. So how big is uh, your queue? How many messages you have there inside? Oh, um, I think we do a quarter billion events per day, roughly. Um, and this is, so on disk, it's 50 gigabytes per day. And as we keep them for 30 days, so we keep uh, one and a half terabytes. Um, no, 250 million per day, roughly. I'm not, I don't have the exact number, it also varies, but uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite a few. I mean, we have, um, I think we have 10 million people playing our games each day. And it's just 10 million unique people. They, they log in multiple times per day. And per session, they generate multiple events. So it kind of makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, but I believe I got the answer from the last question. Uh, I, I saw that you are using Redis. But Redis also has a PubSub uh, option. What, what are the gains from Kafka against the, the Redis? I see that uh, one of gains is in the size of uh, messages, but... Uh, uh, yeah, it's not only, not only the pure size, but the persistent part. That I can say, I want to go, go and go back, I want to go back one week and still consume the events from last week. That would certainly not be possible with Redis. Because, uh, if, I mean, there's two ways to do it with Redis. You can do, use the Redis pops up. That's, that's purely... Uh, there's no storage at all. It just the message goes out as it comes in. If you're not connected, you never see it. If you're not connected in the moment that it's delivered, you never see it. Or the other way would be to use um, sort of like Redis lists as queues, and then they are sort of persistent in in a way. I mean, they are first they are persistent in memory, and then you can also flush them to disk. But you would never be able to keep one and a half terabyte in there, right? So. Um, this is for us the, the, the persistent thing and being able to roll back. That is, that is the killer feature. Hi, uh, nice talk. Um, how many different topics can Kafka manage at the same time? And how is like a file has a minimum size, I guess? So Sorry again, how many topics? How or? many different topics? Yeah, there have been some discussions on the mailing list, on the Kafka mailing list. Um, and I said, I think they said something, I mean, you have to, I mean, every, every topic is a directory, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they don't optimize, okay. there, there's no optimization above that, so you might run into a problem at 65,000, or it depends on your file system, basically. Um, but otherwise, I don't think that Kafka makes any ex, like explicit assumptions about it. So you, with a good file system, maybe you can go to a million, maybe even higher. Um, okay. 
Thanks. <laughs> it might, on the other hand, it might also um, compromise um, the, uh, the, uh, the performance because if you have a small number of topics, they will all, like, all the handles will be open, everything will be in the file system cache, so everything is super fast. If you have like a million topics, they cannot all be open at the same time, right? So. Any more questions? Then I have one more thing. Recognize this guy? Typical backend developer. So we're looking for those guys. <laughs> um, yeah.